So again, welcome everyone. Um, I guess by now everybody knows, but just in case, my name is Igor Shelenko. I'm the current chair of the SIAM Activity Group on Financial Math and Engineering. Um, we had a business meeting, of course, during our uh, SIAM conference on financial math uh, this summer. And it was, in a sense, strongly, strongly suggested that we continue doing the seminar, virtual seminar. The seminar indeed is planned for the entire semester and traditionally would be on the second Thursday uh, of the month, uh, same time, it's uh, 1 p.m. New York time. Um, then um, again, traditionally, the Bachelor of Finance Society will have the complimentary talks on the fourth uh, Thursday of the month, same time, and they also have uh, planned them the, the talks throughout the, the fall. And with that, uh, today we kick off uh, this semester with your career talks. We'll have two talks today, and we'll start with the first one by Gyokshe Dayanikli. And um, the introduction uh, probably doesn't need, uh, because everybody knows uh, Gyokshe, but uh, currently she is an assistant professor at Urbana-Champagne at the Department of Stats. Previous to that, she was at Columbia University as a postdoc and got her PhD uh, from Princeton University, uh, specialized and uh, expert in uh, games, mean field games. And today it would be something related to that from what we see from the title. And uh, Gyeongshi will talk about single level approach to solve uh, Stackelberg mean field games. Floor is yours. Thank you so much, Igor. Thank you so much for the invitation and great introduction. So like uh, I get, I forgot how to use Zoom. So if you have any questions and if I don't see you, you can just unmute yourself and ask it if I, in case I don't see. So today, as I, Igor introduced, I'm gonna talk about a single level approach to solve the Stackelberg mean field games. These are actually intrinsically bi-level problems and I'm gonna mention what's bi-level about them and how we can uh, change these problems to a single level uh, one so we can solve them in a more efficient way. So this is a joint work with Mathieu. He's in uh, NYU Shanghai right now. So I would like to start with a little bit with, with the motivation. So in this case, what we want to do is that we have a regulator or we can call this principle. And this person wants to find the optimal policies or incentives to get the best outcomes when this person interacts with many agents who prioritize their own objectives. Personally, I'm interested in uh, public policy making. That's why this question was uh, a high importance to me. But uh, now we are in the financial math group. So I want to give some financial uh, examples first. And we are going to look at uh, these a little bit later. So for example, we can have a regulator. And this regulator can incentivize a large number of banks who are borrowing and lending from a central bank. And uh, this regulator may try to minimize the expected number of defaults and some other objectives. Or we can have a principal and this principal may try to write an optimal payment contract for a large number of employees. And uh, this principal may try to maximize the year expected return while the employees uh, take care of their own objectives. Some not financial but related uh, examples can be, for example, a government may try to choose the optimal carbon tax level when interacting with a lot of electricity producers who has their own objectives. A company may try to optimize their advertisement decisions when interacting with a lot of consumers, or government may try to find the non-pharmaceutical policies, or for example, social distancing policies, when they are interacting with a, a large number of population who, which is dealing with an epidemic. So these types of applications uh, require us to find the Stackelberg equilibrium between the principal and the large number of agents because the principal is going to have a higher power than this large number of agents. So in order to have uh, some self-contained uh, presentation, I'm going to exp explain what Stackelberg equilibrium is. I think uh, a lot of people here already know about it, but I would like to basically introduce for the people who didn't hear about it much. So in the classical case, basically, we have a leader that I call a principal and a follower that I call agent. This leader chooses some incentives and the follower is going to give the best response to these incentives. And the leader is going to optimize these incentives by taking into account the best response reaction of the follower. So this is different than the Nash equilibrium. 
In the Nash equilibrium, what would happen is that both the leader and the follower would give the year best response, and we would solve these best response mappings that are um, basically um, coupled together with, uh, together. So in our set setup, different than this classical setup, instead of one follower, we are going to have a large number of uh, agents. These uh, can be non-cooperative or competitive. In our case, we are choosing to work with the non-cooperative agents. So in this case, what's going to happen is that instead of uh, one uh, person giving the year best response, this full population is going to give the year Nash equilibrium response to the principal. So here, um, uh, I'm going to basically approximate this Nash equilibrium by using mean field games, because uh, as, you may, as you may know, when we have large number of players, the number of interactions uh, gets exponentially higher, and this is going to make our lives very hard to, while trying to find the equilibrium. And one good approximation would be to use mean field games. So here, let me give some related references to this talk. Basically, uh, related to the contract theory type of models, we have uh, some uh, uh, principal agent models where we have large number of agents. For example, Elim, Australia, and Posomaye has uh, the continuous state space version, and Carmona and Wang has a finite state space version. But as I said, these are contract theory-like models. The year models are in a spatial form, and I'll mention this uh, briefly later. And on the numerical side we, uh, for the machine learning uh, part, we have some other papers. Uh, for example, we have a previous paper that uh, we look at a finite state space case, and Campbell Chancher, Wes, and Germango has a paper where they are trying to solve this uh, problem when the problem is in the bi-level version. So the difference between our uh, previous paper and this paper is that now we are going to look at a more generalized model where we don't need to have this contract theory-like model form. So let me give the outline briefly. What I'm going to do is that I am going to give the mathematical modeling of this takeover mean field games to have everyone in the, on the same page. We are going to introduce the representative agents model because now I'm going to directly introduce the mean field game model. And as we may know, in the mean field game, we look at a representative layer because we assume that people are identical and infinitesimal. Then we are going to define and characterize the mean field Nash equilibrium in this population, and we are going to introduce the principles problem. Then I'm going to explain what is bi-level about this problem, and we are going to discuss how we can write it as a single level problem. Then we are going to briefly discuss how the uh, solution of this single level problem converges to the bi-level problem. Then we are going to discuss the numerical method, and uh, I'm going to discuss some numerical examples, and depending on the time, either one or two examples. So let's start with the mathematical modeling. So at this point, I'm going to assume that the principal is going to set the incentives beforehand. Given these incentives, I'm going to focus on the agent population. Then we are going to focus on the principal's uh, optimization later. At first, I'm going to assume that these incentives are time-dependent incentives, and we are going to denote them with lambda t. But then we are going to discuss some extensions where we can actually pet, uh, have pet-dependent uh, incentives still. But for now, let's uh, have the simplified uh, version. We have the following cost of the representative player. As I said uh, here, directly I am focusing on the mean field game, and I'm not introducing the finite player version. So in the objective function, basically, this uh, we are going to have a running cost part and a terminal cost part. We have a continuous time model. The running cost part is going to depend on the state's own, sorry, agents' own state X, agents' own control alpha, and the agents' interactions with the population through the state distribution in the population. Again, in the extensions, this can be the joint state and uh, control distribution. And uh, this person is uh, going to also interact with the principal through the principal's incentives lambda t. So agent state is going to uh, follow the following dynamics. It is going to depend on its own state control, the interactions with the population, and also the interaction with the principal. So this is a, a very normal uh, mean field game type of model. And now we can introduce the mean field Nash equilibrium, basically. For the mean field Nash equilibrium, we need to have two conditions to be satisfied. First, we are focusing on a representative player, and this representative player is infinitesimal, so the year behavior is going to, when we change the year behavior, is not going to affect the population's distribution. 
So what we need to do is that we need to find the best response of this representative player given a distribution of the population, and we are going to call this alpha hat. Then what we need to have is the consistency condition or fixed point argument, which means uh, that the distribution of the state that is induced by this optimal control should be actually indeed the population distribution that we fixed at the beginning. The reason for this is that we are assuming that the people are identical. So the uh, state should be actually equal to the uh, state distribution should be equal to the population state distribution that we fixed at the beginning. So at this point, we are going to call this couple of mean fields Nash equilibrium. And there are different ways to characterize this thing. And uh, we are going to be using the forward backward stochastic differential equations to characterize it. Here, uh, we are not going to be using Pontryagin maximum principle. Instead, we are going to uh, basically use uh, the fact that our adjoint process is going to represent the value function, and it is uh, going to be helpful in our approach. So at this point, we know how to uh, model our agent population given the principle, how we can model the equilibrium, and how we can basically characterize this equilibrium. Now our um, uh, next step is basically introducing the principle. So principle is going to have their own objectives. So this is different than the mean field control setup where a social planner tries to minimize the cost of the society. Instead, principle is uh, their own person, they have their own objectives. So they have a running cost part and a terminal cost part, and they are interacting with the population through the population distribution, so a distribution of the population state. So here, as you see, the year, uh, cost is also going to get affected uh, by these incentives. Again, as I said, we took these incentives as a time-dependent uh, uh, policies, but actually later we are going to discuss some extensions where we have the path-dependent ones. So our uh, principal's objective uh, function is not just minimizing, optimization problem is not just minimizing this objective function, it should take into account uh, the reaction of the agents too. So here, basically underlying, uh, we need to assume that the mean field Nash equilibrium is going to be given as a response to this lambda. So basically, the problem is going to become an obje uh, objective that a uh, principal tries to minimize while trying to make the equilibrium happen. So in this case, the full problem in a mathematical way can be written like this. It might be a little bit uh, um, too, too much equations, but let me explain the intuition. At uh, the top, we have the optimization of the principle. They are interacting with uh, the population through the population distribution, and they are choosing the policies lambda. And at the bottom, we have the equilibrium in the population. As I said, we, it is characterized with a forward-backward stochastic differential equation. The forward part is basically the state dynamics, and the backward part is characterizing uh, the value function. That's why the terminal uh, uh, condition of this backward uh, equation is actually the terminal cost of the minor player or agent. As you see, this is G for the principle I am using G0, so they are different. So here, this problem is a bi-level problem. Why? Because uh, at the top, we have the optimization of the principle. And for any, choosing, uh, any chosen lambda t, we need to, lambda t uh, sequence, we need to find the equilibrium. We need to solve this forward-backward. Then we need to plug uh, the mu that we find from this forward-backward equations back into the optimization. And we need to do this uh, two-level steps over and over again until convergence. So this is uh, this can be done, but uh, if you want to do some numerical approach, this might be a little bit inefficient depending on the model. And here, what we want to do is that we want to get rid of this bi-level uh, uh, approach, and we want to write it as a single-level uh, model. So let's look how we can do this. What we are going to do is that we need to do some rewriting. As I said that we have the uh, forward and backward uh, equations that characterizes the, that characterize the Nash equilibrium in the population. So we, in the end, we want to do some kind of numerical approach. One thing we can do is that we can uh, simulate forward, then plug in and simulate backward, then do forward again, and it is going to be a little bit inefficient. Another thing we can do is that we can actually change the uh, direction of time in this equation we can start from an initial point and we can uh, simulate this uh, um, basically process of y and x together. And at the end, we can try to shoot this terminal point. 
So if we do that, this is going to be rewritten like this, but we are going to add uh, another uh, level of complexity to the problem. What we are going to have is that we are going to end up with a constraint. So this constraint says that this uh, previously backward equations terminal condition should be satisfied. And at this point, what we are going to have is that our controls of the problem uh, is going to change too. Now we have a problem where we choose lambda, the initial point of y0 and z. And this problem is constrained because we need to satisfy this thing while minimizing this thing to find the Stekelberg mu field game equilibrium. Because if this thing is not satisfied, it means that we didn't find the Nash equilibrium. So what we are going to have is uh, that we have a constrained problem. And uh, in optimization, constrained problems are a little bit tricky. So we, what we can do is basically we can put this uh, constraint as a penalty to the objective function, which is very common in the optimization. So what we do is that we introduce a penalty function and we put uh, this penalty function back into the original objective of the principle. So now we have the original objective of the principle and the X and Y are, are going to be simulated according to the forward forward stochastic differential equations. Then we are going to end up with a terminal condition for this YT and we are going to match it. And according to our error, we are going to have some kind of penalty. And in front of this, we are going to put a coefficient to show how much this penalty is important for us. So at this point, now we don't have a constraint problem, but the important thing is that uh, this constraint should be satisfied. So we need to discuss how this convergence of this solution going to happen to the original problem. So let's look at our rewritten penalized problem and discuss how it is now single level. Now we have uh, this uh, objective. This is the principles part, and this is the penalty part and we simulate our x and y, starting by uh, y0. This is one of our controls, and we control the coefficients of the randomness that's here, and we also control the policy lambda. So when we minimize this part, it means that we are going to be making this uh, uh, objective of the principle as small as possible, and if this thing is going to zero, then this uh, means that the Nash equilibrium is also found too. So now this is a single level problem. We don't need to do optimization at the bottom and the equilibrium finding at the uh, lower level. We can just uh, do one optimization at the same time. So here the important uh, question, the theoretical part of this uh, problem is that how we can uh, actually say that uh, the parameterized problem solution is converging to the solution of the original problem. Here actually we have two steps of changing the problem. The first one is that we had the original one where we try to minimize the principal's cost such that the forward forward stochastic differential equations hold that are going to give the Nash equilibrium characterization. And for finding really the Nash equilibrium, we need to have this constraint. The second one is the penalized problem that I just introduced where we put this constraint back into the objective. And then we need to have a parameterized problem. This part is important for the numerical part. Now uh, for our uh, um, controls that we denote as beta for a compact uh, representation is going to be parameterized and we need to show that this solution of the parameterized problem should converge to the original problem. So what we do is that very, uh, because of the time uh, uh, con uh, constraint, I'm going to be very intuitive here. What we have is that uh, as new here, the coefficient of the penalty part goes to infinity. The solution of this penalized problem is going to converge to the solution of the original problem. And the other theorem that shows that the parameterized uh, problem solution converges to the solution of the penalized problem. So at the end, this one converges to this one, this one converges to this one. So we can say the parameterized problem is good at uh, finding the solution for the original problem. So after this, now we can uh, introduce the numerical approach for the single level model. We, what we are going to do is that we need to approximate functions for the controls of the problem. So here you can use different uh, function approximations. What we did is uh, using the neural networks. The reason for this is that we can increase uh, the uh, dimensions freely or we can have nonlinear problems easily. In the paper, we are comparing numerical solution uh, uh, results 
with uh, ex nearly explicitly solvable uh, uh, problems just to show the solutions. But uh, our main motivation is uh, actually trying to solve some models that we can't solve explicitly. So what we do is that we are going to parameterize this uh, new controls. Lambda was the incentive of the principle. Z is the coefficient in front of the randomness. And Y0 was the initial point of the previous backward equation. So we are going to implement neural networks. For example, lambda was a function of time. It's going to take the time as a input, and it's going to return a value, which is going to be the policy level. Then what we do is that we are going to simulate the trajectories of x and y after doing uh, time discretization. These are the now forward forward uh, uh, stochastic differential equations. And as you can see, lambda here and z here are getting the values from the neural networks. And the initial point of y0 is going to be also a neural network result. So here, uh, the another important thing is that, that uh, for the distribution of uh, for the distribution, we are approximating it and we are using the empirical distribution. This is uh, because we are doing this by basically simulating an a population of size n, and we are using their empirical distribution. So what we do is that finally we need to find uh, the neural, best neural networks. What we do is uh, that we are minimizing the error. But here our error is basically the objective function of the principle and also this uh, penalty part that uh, gives us the Nash equilibrium result. So what we do is to minimize uh, this uh, time discretized and penalized cost to find the best function approximators for the controls. So now I'm going to discuss just a little bit extensions. The previous part, uh, uh, the previous model was used in the theory part, but in the numeric uh, extensions are very, um, I think, easy to do. But in the theory part, we are actually also working currently to build up these extensions. So here, uh, basically what we are going to do is that we can have a contractory type of uh, model, which means that we can have a path dependent terminal payment. And we can also have, as I said, the interactions through the distribution of the control and state instead of just the distribution of the state. So it's more like an extended mean field game. So in this part, the representative agents model is going to have this extra term, which is uh, the utility from this path dependent uh, incentive that is given by the principle. This psi is going to be F big T measurable. And for the principle, we can also add this thing. The difference uh, from the regular contract theory ones is uh, that we have this G0 here too, because normally when we don't have this thing, we can uh, uh, plug in the terminal condition of the uh, terminal condition of YT back into the, uh, back into the principles problem directly. But in this case, when we have this uh, uh, terminal points, this is not doable. So let me look at one experiment result because uh, I think for the second one, I don't have enough time. For the first one, I'm going to look at a systemic risk model that was uh, proposed by Carmen Fug and Son. In this one, what uh, they had is that they had a large uh, population of banks. What we do is that for our case, we are adding a regulator. And uh, the year, this is the year model that they propose. Basically, they have a representative bank uh, that has a state, which is the log cash reserve X. And they are choosing how much uh, to borrow or lend from the central bank, not from each other. And uh, according to this, the year log cash reserve changes and they some objectives, for example, they want to be close to the average level of uh, log cash reserve. So on top of this, what we do is that we are adding a principle. As uh, you can see, this principle is going to be affecting this coefficient. Actually, in uh, uh, the year paper, they are saying that if a regulator is added to this, uh, the effect of lambda t is a, a way to control for control the for the regulator. So that's why we decided uh, that the principle should control this lambda t. And what they do is that uh, they are trying to be close to a uh, lambda t aim. This is going to be exogenous. And they are also trying to minimize uh, the uh, probability of uh, banks are default. So what uh, we are going to have is that at first, if you don't have this uh, part, if the gamma is zero, what we expect is that they are going to, to set the lambda t equals the lambda t aim. And according to this lambda t, we need to find the Nash equilibrium. And uh, if gamma is not equal to zero, then uh, this lambda t should uh, differ from the lambda t aim. 
So we first look at this gamma equal to zero case. So what we expect is uh, for lambda to be equal to lambda aim. So as you see that the lambda aim is the orange line and or lambda that we find from this uh, numerates is nearly equal to this level as we expected. And uh, um, as a result, uh, as a response to this, we also find the Nash equilibrium uh, response of the uh, agents, basically. But the important thing here is that the penalty graph, as you see, the penalty is uh, going towards zero, which means that the Nash equilibrium is indeed solved. Because we uh, showed that as new goes to uh, new was the parameter for the penalty. As the, it goes to infinity, it indeed converges, but we can also see numerically that uh, this uh, is uh, converging, which means that Nash equilibrium is indeed solved. And we also look at uh, the case where gamma is uh, not equal to zero. So in that case, as we expected uh, that uh, lambda is not equal to lambda aim or like doesn't have to be equal to lambda aim. Again, the important part is that we check our penalty and it converges to zero which means that uh, with this single approach, while we are trying to minimize the objective of the principle, we are still uh, finding the Nash equilibrium at the same time. So here I'm going to skip this uh, example because of the time, but I'm happy to discuss later. So thank you so much for your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to discuss further. Yes, thanks, uh, thanks Yanche for for nice talk and nice to being right on time. Uh, we yeah. have a couple of minutes uh, for some quick questions now, but as always, we will have uh, you know an informal session at the end uh, of the the two talks, and we can discuss even more. Any questions now, somebody? No. A quick uh, question. All right. Um, I, I'll I'll have a quick question. So at some point you showed that uh, you know you have these two steps, and you said we prove, and you showed those two theorems that you proved. Can you comment, but briefly, on how did you prove actually that? Is it uh, yeah? Um, mm -hmm. The important thing here is that oh, sorry. The important thing yeah. here is that we need to show the continuity of uh, this mm -hmm. J zero with respect to beta and P bar with respect to beta. And uh, that was the main step. After using that, we take the, we have the beta case sequence. We take the limit of this beta case and uh, we are able to put the limit inside. And uh, like uh, later I have some appendix uh, uh, parts. I can give you this and we can discuss. Uh -huh, so, okay. All right. I, see, I, see, I, see, <laughs> I put I this, I was ready for this uh, question. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I, I think. Yeah. Sure. Can I, I ask see. a quick question? Quick one. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Sebastian, please. Yeah. So it's actually it's also about this uh, this parameter new. So in 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 order for the result to hold, you have to take new to infinity, right? But I guess mm -hmm. in the implementation, uh, you're using some finite new or some rules. Yes. So how, how do you go about? Doing that. Yeah. Do any, any uh, what we did is uh, a little bit of uh, luck. For example, I started first with a new equals to five, and it didn't work very well. Then I tried a little bit harder, uh, higher. For example, I think in this ones I'm trying new equals to ten, something like that, and I saw that the penalty uh, was uh, converging to uh, zero. So that was actually how we kind of tried and uh, saw the error. But the, oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here I'm trying to see, sorry, I didn't put the new here, but as far as I remember, I try new equals to 10 and I see that it's converging to zero. So it was a little bit trial and error in the right. race. I mean, one one way you might be able to make it a little more sort of automatic is using this, um, what's it called again, this augmented Lagrangian approach, where, mm. where you have new times your penalty and then you have uh, something times sort of the, the penalty squared. And then there's a mm. really, an update method for going between the the new and uh let's call it mu the um mm. and the square oh i see so, i didn't yeah. know this method but i'll check maybe it would be good we are revising this useful. paper right now so mm -hmm. i think uh, maybe we can implement it in that uh, case that would be great thank you so much for the yeah, recommendation um okay we have one more question in q a by uh, kami okay. but i think we need to to if i may to move to the next talk and then we have more discussions at the end if 
that would not be a problem. And um, because we are, you know, have to be on time, uh, some people have to leave earlier. Uh, uh, David, do you want to, to to share, please, your screen? So thank you, thank you again, Gyochi, uh, one more time. And uh, we'll thank uh, with big applause both speakers at the end. Um, Tomoyuki also has a question. Tomoyuki, if you have a question or a comment, Tomoyuki, you raised your hand. I'm so sorry. No, no question. Thank you. Uh -huh. So let's assume that was an applause uh, for uh, for the speaker. So, uh, okay, we move to the second talk uh, uh, of uh, today. And uh, again, it's our pleasure to have uh, David Itkin uh, speaking on ergodic uh, robust maximization of asymptotic growth with stochastic factors. Uh, David currently is at Imperial College London uh, as a postdoc. Uh, previous to that, he was getting his PhD uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, and uh, generally speaking, works on stochastic portfolio theory. And I believe uh, today's talk will be something related in, in some sense to that. David, please. Uh, thank you very much, Igor, for the introduction. And thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be here. So today I, I wanna talk about this topic and this is based on joint work with uh, Benedict Koch, Martin Larson, and Joseph Peckman. And so first of all, I'll just briefly motivate uh, the problem that we're trying to solve. And then I'll discuss uh, robust classes of measures. Uh, there will be several classes that will appear that we, we consider. And part of this will be discussing a paper that really motivated our work, which was the paper of Gerard Robertson. So I'll very briefly summarize their results. And then I'll discuss what's new in, in our results, which is how we incorporate stochastic factors. Uh, and then I'll finish off basically with our, our results. And if there's time, some interpretations and examples. Uh, but if not, then that, that can be saved also for the discussion after. So uh, we have a financial market. We're gonna have the uh, risky assets. Uh, you should think of D kind of as the large, this is kind of the applications we, we had in mind. And there would be one risk-free asset, uh, which we'll assume for simplicity has um, interest rate zero. So then the asset process will denote by X. Uh, we'll take a kind of an abstract setup. So it will take values in some open set uh, E of, of RD. And the problem we're interested in is one where an investor tries to maximize their growth uh, over a long time horizon. So you can think of, for example, endowment funds or pension funds that may be interested in, in long time horizons. And basically for tractability, we're actually going to study the asymptotic problem here. So the time horizon T will be infinity. So then we're going to model X uh, as a continuous semi martingale And so I'll have at this point some very general drift and, and volatility coefficients. And so then, of course, immediately when you write down the model, the first question is, what are the coefficients, right? What is the drift and what is the volatility? And then usually the answer is something like, well, you should estimate it from data or you should use something that is realistic. And so then the next question then is, what can we actually estimate from data? What can we get good estimates for? And, and how do we do this? And so um, it's kind of vague, but sort of well-known statements uh, in the financial literature. Uh, is that the, in general, if, if you compare the drift and volatility, the volatility is a bit easier to estimate, um, basically because, you know, in financial data, it's very noisy. And so trust me, the drift is more difficult because there's a, a low signal to noise ratio. Okay, so a bit vague. I'm not trying to say here that volatility is easy to estimate, but at least if you're thinking about uh, comparatively, uh, the drift is, is generally speaking harder. And so this is what we want to focus on here is we're going to, uh, fix a functional form for the volatility, and we'll discuss more about the various forms one can take. This will be an important feature in, in our in our results. Uh, but we're gonna we're we're not gonna fix the drift exactly, essentially. Uh, and so then, if we don't do that, then what what can you do? And so the idea here is this is not a new one. It's it's quite old actually. Uh, I think it goes back to, to maybe uh, nights for many uncertainty. But the basic idea is we're going to try to fix some quantities that we think we can reliably estimate, and we're going to allow for model uncertainty or misspecification with respect to the other quantities. And so then the way we'll, we'll set up this problem is we're going to try to maximize the investor's growth uh, over uh, some class of models. And maybe uh, we're going to have a soup in problem where we maximize over strategies and we minimize over, over uh, admissible models. So we're going to fix the functional form of volatility, like I mentioned. Uh, but is there anything else we can we can fix? And so this is where the gas portfolio theory um, insights or, or 
framework comes in. Uh, and so this is just for, we're not gonna necessarily fix, you know, the state space to be the simplex, which is the one I'm looking at on the slide, uh, but this is to kind of uh, give some motivation for, for the setup, the abstract setup that we'll take later, which may be applicable in other steps. So if we take the state space to be the simplex, then you can interpret uh, X, this asset process as the so-called market weights. So the X sub I is given as the ith capitali capitalization of the ith stock divided by the sum of all the capitalizations in the market. So it presents the proportion of the market that uh, a certain asset takes up. And the one uh, important empirical property is the so-called stability of the capital distribution curves, which is plotted here. And so what this is, is uh, basically there is you know, data going back almost 100 years. And so on that particular day listed here, you look at the all the stocks in the US equity market, at least those in the CRSP universe, which is where this uh, plot was created from. And you compute the market weights and you rank them and you plot this on a log log scale, uh, which is depicted here. And so what you can see is that obviously the curves are gonna be different uh, and certainly they will be different in the tails where the number of stocks in the market has changed, but especially here in the middle part of the curve and also to some extent uh, for the larger stocks, you see that there is the shape is, is kind of roughly the same and there is some, some stability here. And so then this motivates kind of the problem that we're gonna consider, which is that uh, we can maybe estimate the invariant density of of the asset process. And so what we're gonna consider is a problem where we fix two inputs and allow for uncertainty of the others. So the first input will be the volatility structure like I mentioned previously, and the second one will be invariant density. And so this is actually also the setup of a previous paper of Kadaras Robertson, which motivated our work. So what's gonna be new here is that we're gonna not only consider kind of the complete market setup, but we're gonna consider the setup of incomplete markets where we have uh, an additional stochastic factor. So before I, I get into the mathematical details, I wanna just bring up a question of, of Bob Fernholz that he posed uh, 20 years ago in his celebrated book. And so this is a screenshot from that book. So the question was, how do you develop a theory of optimization for function generated portfolios? Or the follow-up problem is just in general developing a theory of optimization that is dependent only on observable parameters. And so this may seem maybe vaguely related at this point, but what's gonna turn out is our results will be, will in some sense uh, answer this question. And so I'll come back to this at the end, but I wanted to just, just keep this in the back of your mind uh, throughout the talk. And just uh, somebody's maybe not aware, what, what is a function generated portfolio? It's essentially a special kind of portfolio where the logarithmic wealth of the investor at any given time can be represented in the following ways. So it can be represented as a function evaluated at the current weights plus uh, a finite variation process. So if a portfolio has this property, then we say it's function generated by, by the function G. Okay, so now let's, let's introduce the problem in a bit more mathematical framework. So we're gonna fix a canonical probability space and we're gonna look at a class of measures pi, which are gonna consist of possible laws for the asset process X. So any member of pi could be something that actually truly drives X uh, from the perspective of, of the model. Um, and so what we're gonna impose on this class pi is that X is a continuous semi-martingale so that we can define training strategies and genetic stochastic integration. Um, and then there will be further restrictions and different restrictions lead to different problems and lead to different papers and literature. So I'll talk about that on the next slide. So then theta will be the set of all strategies, which are training strategies. So they consist of all predictable processes that are X integrable. And then for a strategy theta and a given measure in the class, the wealth process is defined in the usual way. So it's a stochastic exponential of, of this integral. And the quantity of interest for us is the apentotic growth rate, which is defined here. So it depends on your strategy theta, it depends on the measure P. And uh, okay, it's, the, it's a little bit complicated, this expression is because it's defined for somewhat technical reasons as an improbability definition for the asymptotic growth rate. But essentially what you're doing is you're taking the maximum value so that your growth rate, which is this quantity here, asymptotically as t goes to infinity uh, is larger than the gamma with probability one. And you take the largest such, such value. Okay, and so then with this criterion, uh, the goal is to find, like I mentioned, the supin problem, the robust growth rate. So this will denote as lambda pi. So this is the maximum uh, overall your strategies under the worst case measure. And maybe even more importantly, to also identify the uh, optimal strategy theta hat that achieves this growth rate. So what possible other restrictions may one put on pi? And so this, in the literature, I'll go briefly through, through the slide. 
Um, this is not a literature review on all of robust finance, of course. This is just on this kind of particular asymptotic growth problem. So we'll denote by C the instantaneous uh, diffusion matrix of X. And so the first paper I'm aware of that kind of considered this type of setup is by Carrasso Roberts in 2012, where basically they fix the volatility structure to be some feedback form function C, which is known. And they considered more or less uh, full drift uncertainty, without, at least without any other inputs. Uh, by Rockton and Wang then considered a, a slightly more generalized setup where you allow C to be not fixed. So there's some volatility uncertainty, but it depends. Uh, it lies in some, some class of, of matrices. And then in 2021 is really when the problem I kind of motivated from the beginning was, was introduced by another paper of Carlos Robertson, where in addition to fixing this volatility structure C, which was again a feedback form, they also uh, input this invariant density P, which was representing the stability I, I, I had mentioned earlier. And so they imposed that the, basically that the invariant that P is the invariant density of, of, of X. Uh, in a previous work, we rather than we took the same setup as kind of Gross Robertson, and rather than imposing further restrictions on the class pi, we looked at kind of a, a certain type of long only problem. Uh, and but here we want to do something different, which is that we want to allow for basically an incomplete market type of setup where um, the the uh, you know the volatility matrix and also the invariant density uh, can depend on on y, so some stochastic type for y. Okay. So I'll introduce that in, in a slide or two, but first let me just tell you about the main result of Carras Robinson so that we can kind of compare compare what happens with the stochastic factor. So if you denote by L to be this quantity, which is the, gra the log gradient of P and, and this kind of correction term involving the, the C matrix, then to make sure that this problem is somewhat well posed or well posed, uh, there's basically two things that need to, to happen. So the first thing is you need to have a finite growth rate in the model. Um, so this is easily handled by uh, imposing that this integral, which just involves the input, is, is finite. And the second thing you need to do is that, which is a bit more kind of complicated to state, is that you need at least one measure in your class pi, otherwise the, class, or that the problem is, is opposed. And so uh, the assumption here is that there's going to be a non-explosive solution to the, a certain particle problem corresponding to, to this operator. And so where, where does that come from? Um, well. Basically, in the Carlos Robertson paper, they show that when D is one, if this assumption fails, then you really do have a degenerate problem. So either the class is NC or you have infinite growth. And uh, in the higher dimensional case, this is kind of an actual natural assumption to make because this operator L is the symmetric one with respect to the variant measure. Okay, so when you have these two uh, and some additional kind of technical requirements, which are just integrability assumptions, then the problem is well posed. And what they managed to show is that there will exist um, an optimal strategy. And this strategy is actually function generated. So there exists a function p hat, which solves this PDE. And the growth rate is given as an integral of this with the inputs. And the optimal strategy, like I said, is function generated by, by, this, by this function and achieves the same growth rate at every measure. So this is a, a classification of the problem. And so this is, again, this is the result. Um, and so the main takeaways is, is, again, like I said, it's function generated. These you know portfolios have performance guarantees, and maybe the crucial thing is that it really the strategy really only depends on observables. It only depends on the current value of x. Uh, and so the question we had is that basically, does this happen because that's the form for the volatility matrix? So the input here c right only depends on x, and so the variant density as well. And so then it may be that because of this, it only depends on the current value of x t. And so our question was quite simple to state qualitatively, which is what happens when you allow C and P to depend on a stochastic factor. And, um, you know, this is kind of, it's widely considered, uh, I guess, in the literature that um, the volatility of assets is determined not only by, you know, current, current asset levels, but also by, by certain other things, factors, maybe economic conditions and, and so on. And so then now to introduce our setup. So again, E will be the uh, state space for the asset process. And we're going to have D, which is a subset of RM, which will be the state space for this factor process Y. Uh, we'll take F to be the product space. So this is really the triple XY that we're considering. That's that's X domain. And we're again going to input two, two inputs, uh, C and P. And so C will be, again, the volatility matrix of just X. Uh, and P will be the joint invariant density of X and Y. In terms of regularity for the coefficients, um, we basically need C2 regularity, which is similar to Carras Robinson in X, 
and um, we only need really quite weak of the global uh, regularity in, in Y. So we'll fix the canonical probability space and the coordinate process uh, will be Z will be tuple, tuple of X, Y. And so then our first class that we consider is the class pi zero. And so this is uh, consists of all measures uh, that satisfy these three properties. So the first one is that the quadratic variation or the volatility structure is given exactly by this matrix C. Uh, and notice here, it depends on the stochastic factor Y. The second is a joint, uh, is this joint invariant density property for the joint process X and Y. So again, this is where the second input P appears. Uh, the last one is that we require the laws of XT to be, to be tight. Okay, so this is the baseline class pi zero that we consider. So one thing I want to just mention right away is that notice here, there's no restriction on the dynamics of Y. And so in particular, this class will have some laws where Y is a semi-martingale, some laws where Y may not be a semi-martingale. Uh, and so, for example, if you uh, want to consider rough volatility model, some of, some of those measures may be, may be considered as part of our, our class. Okay. Later, I'm going to look at some slight enlargements and restricted versions of pi zero. So we'll, we'll look at what happens when you take slightly different setups as well. Okay, so then again, to ensure, um, ensure this problem is well posed, we're going to make similar assumptions um, to Cardassus Robertson. So we're going to need a finite growth assumption. We're going to need a non-degeneracy of the class assumption. And so to do this, we'll actually assume that there will be some law in our class where y is a semi martingale. And so for some volatility matrix of y, We'll denote by C joint the joint volatility matrix, and L is again the similar quantity as before. And so then our assumptions are similar finite growth assumption that this integral here is finite uh, for some CY. And again, the symmetric symmetric uh, diffusion is, is in the class, so it's not explosive, um, which basically means you'll, you'll have uh, your density here. Okay, so this is analogous to the Kuras Roberts assumption. And so now I can state the first version of our theorem, which Says, so what happens when you have a stochastic factor Y? Well, it turns out that the optimal strategy is still functionally generated. So there exists a solution B hat to this PDE, which determines the optimal strategy. And uh, it only depends on X. Okay, So the growth rate is given, again, by some integral involving this and the average matrix A. Uh, so here you just average uh, volatility matrix C against the invariant density, but you only average over Y. And um, yeah, so this determines the optimal strategy. It's function generated even in the stochastic factor case. It only depends on 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 x. Um, however, the assumptions that are needed for this are quite implicit. So the integrality bounds that you get actually involve the unknown or the solution here p hat. Um, and so we can put some sufficient conditions uh, where you can um, actually check the implicit assumptions directly, but they require additional structure that we honestly weren't too happy about. Uh, the difficulty seemed technical in nature. So we wanted to strengthen this result with, with weaker assumptions. Uh, and it turns out that you can you can do this uh, as long as you kind of just ever so slightly enlarge your class of measures. So let me discuss this next. I'll, we'll need the notion of a K uh, modification, uh, which is a fancy name for something that's not, not too hard to understand. Basically, this matrix C that's an input, um, we say C tilde is a K modification of it. If for this set K, uh, which is a subset of the state space, the C tilde will be equal to C on K uh, and for every Y, so cross D. Uh, and outside of K, it could differ, but in such a way that the average matrix A doesn't change. Okay. And so then if we consider pi K to be the set of laws where we can replace C by a K modification. And so then this class is larger because C itself is a K modification of C and I'm allowing some other, other matrices. Uh, so this will contain pi zero and the largest class is actually when you take K to be the empty set where you don't require C and C tilde to actually equal each other anywhere, but you do require the average to be, to be the same. And so why is this a slight uh, increase in the class? Well, because if you give me a tolerance epsilon, then I can find a K epsilon a complex that's large enough so that uniformly across all measures in the class, X will spend less than epsilon proportion of its time in the complement, so in the set where I change the input matrix C. And so from this perspective, for K large enough, pi K and pi zero will be kind of statistically indistinguishable. Uh, and so it's, you can really, if you take K large, you can really view it as a really slight modification. Uh, but for 
you know, if we do this, then we can get a, a stronger uh, result in the sense that we have explicit now uh, conditions that one can check with the inputs. Uh, and we do check it for some examples in the paper. And uh, what turns out to be the case is that for any such uh, K, so for any class pi K, again, you get the same optimal strategy, which depends only on this B hat, which again, only depends on X, not on the stochastic factor. Uh, it achieves the same growth rate in every measure. And all of these quantities are independent of K. Okay, so you not only have robustness in some sense uh, across the class, but you have it across this, this range of classes. Uh, okay, so the last variation of the problem I want to talk about is, is uh, basically shrinking the class. So currently we were, like I mentioned earlier, we we're entirely robust over the dynamics of Y. Uh, and so this may be appropriate for some factors, but it may be that you could actually incorporate more information for, for certain other factors. So for example, one, one thing to have in mind would be something like if YT is the VIX, so the current level of total market volatility, uh, the VIX is not at least directly tradable, but it is uh, observable at very high frequencies. And so in principle, if you're using something like the VIX, you might be able to additionally estimate the joint covariance matrix of X and Y uh, from this data. And so then maybe if you input this extra information to the problem, then uh, you know what would what would change is, is the question uh, in the in the last part of the talk. And so here we'll input a, a joint covariance matrix of x and y, and to keep the notation the same for the previous part of the talk, c will denote the just the x part, uh, c y will denote the volatility matrix for y, and, and the x y will be the cross one. And so then we consider a similar class, which will I'll put a superscript j for joint here. Uh, where essentially it's the same conditions as before, except uh, we impose that Y is also semi-martingale and the joint covariance structure is given by this input. And so then we want to solve again the similar problem where you look at the supin problem, but now over this, this smaller class. And the reason it's smaller is we're imposing further restrictions on Y and essentially the same restrictions on, on X. And so then you have this additional information and maybe then the, the result changes. Um, and uh, just to mention, the, the K-modified class is kind of defined in an analogous way as, as before. And so then the, the third version of the domain theorem is that actually even, even with this additional information, uh, you get the same strategy being robust. Okay, so the same V hat, the same strategy is again, uh, robust growth optimal. So I have, I have one or two minutes here, so let me just give you one interpretation about why, why you get this to happen because it's a little bit surprising, right? So even with the stochastic factor Y, the optimal strategy only depends on, on XT, not on YT. And in some cases, Y may be observable, uh, or in the last case I presented, at least its characteristics may be, may be known, or at least volatility characteristics. And so the intuition here, and the way the proof kind of goes, is that we're still ro you know, robust over the drift of Y. So this is kind of variable up to having this periodicity condition uh, in the limit. And it turns out, and this is kind of the bulk of the paper, it's, it's a hard analytical problem um, that you know, takes up quite a bit of space in the paper, but essentially by choosing the drift appropriately, you can construct a certain worst case measure under which this strategy that only depends on X is actually going to optimal over, over all strategies. And so in other words, if you take another strategy that depends on the current value, let's say YT, under this particular worst case measure, it will actually do worse than, than this the strategy that depends on, on X, okay? So does that mean Y is completely superfluous? No. Um, even though you know the value YT or its trajectory doesn't enter into the strategy, some information about it does, and it's basically the long-term average uh, of Y enters, and it enters through this average matrix A. So here you're, you know you see the average value of Y somehow entering the long-term average value of Y. Um, there's a second interpretation which I'll go through very briefly, and then I'll conclude. Uh, so since the function P hat only depends on X. You can actually view it as being robust growth optimal to the original Cardaris Robertson problem without a stochastic factor. If you choose an appropriate input matrix C and P, which in their setup only depends on X. And so then if you view it from that perspective, then what a result shows is that not only is that strategy uh, optimal in their setup, but it's actually optimal over a, a much larger class uh, of measures, namely those that depend on any additional stochastic factor in any open set, including space, as long as its average uh, with respect to this invariant measure P is, is uh, the same, okay? So let me skip the example because I, I don't think I have time for this. 
uh, let me just go back to Bernholz's uh, question. So the question was developing a theory of optimization for function data portfolios or in general portfolios that are dependent only on observable parameters. So the Kravitzer and Robertson really set up this framework to study this problem, and they established optimality using a particular function genetic portfolio. But their, their setup was restricted to a certain Markovian volatility structure. And you know, it is kind of widely accepted that volatility depends on, on other things other than the feedback you know, price uh, of the asset. And so our result aimed to, to kind of try to generalize this a bit and to solve the problem by removing this restriction. And so we found actually very similar qualitative results, which is that the optimal portfolio remains function generated, depends only on XT, which is observable, and it's optimal actually over several different classes of measures, depending on how you set up the problem. And so this establishes a pretty comprehensive answer to the question uh, proposed by Bernholz um, uh, in his book. Okay, um, there's a lot of future work I'm not going to go through in detail, but I'll, I'll just leave it up here uh, during the question period. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, any questions from uh, the audience or comments or remarks? Tomoyuki, you connected video. Do you want to ask a question or? Uh, yes, I, can I ask a quick question? I would, I would I expect think that you would ask a... a question or question. So thank you, Tomoyuki. Go ahead, please. Um, you mentioned about the uh, finite time, T, in the fifth, fifth breadpoint. point. Do you want to explain it a bit more? Could you explain? Right, can you repeat that finite time over the question? Mm -hmm. Finite time problem. I was thinking that finite time t, the role of y is still important. As t goes to infinity, the role of y becomes smaller or diminishes to zero. Right? Yeah, we, we don't know okay. how to handle the finite uh, time horizon case um, directly because somehow here, the ergodicity kicks in kind of really in the infinite horizon. Um, one thing that maybe is worth mentioning is, is if you actually start your process stationarity, then you can kind of view uh, the results as holding in finite time as well. Uh, but okay, it's a bit tricky because some of our, some of the members of the class are not Markovian, for example. And so then you have to, if you wanted to do the finite time without anything extra, but just from our results, you would have to really restrict the measures that are stationary which is maybe a stronger restriction than, than what we'd like to make. But the finite case is, is I, I don't know how to do it. It's, it's harder. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Tomoyuki. Uh, any other question before uh, Sebastian, please? Yeah, so, th yeah, thanks for the interesting talk. I'm curious about uh, the case. So this is for growth optimal portfolios, right? And you're robustifying in, in this context. So obviously one of the, Key, key, you know, critics, if you will, uh, about the whole Bernholz approach and the SPT is that is is it really relevant to just be looking at growth? Um, what about risk? And how would you incorporate risk into the whole question? Yeah, no, that that's a valid criticism and uh, a good question. So one thing one can do is to impose certain restrictions on the trading strategies, um, and this is a good point because some of the practical examples we have, actually the optimal strategy is very leveraged and not, it's very risky. Uh, so one thing you can do is you can try to impose certain uh, restrictions on your strategies, like long only restrictions or, or others. And we did this not in the stochastic factor case, but in a similar setup in a, in a previous paper. Um, the other thing that uh, is something that uh, we've been thinking about, but we don't know how to do yet is, is to try and solve a similar problem using the different utility functions like power utility. Um, but this is again trickier because it, there are certain properties of log that, that play nicely with with this. Um, so that would be a, a, I think, a really nice next step if if possible to do as well. Yeah. 